Good evening, everyone. And we already have a like on this video. Off to a strong start there, Matt. <laughs> yeah, nice. That's cool. Uh, welcome back, everyone. It's Thursday evening, a little later than usual, but we are going to be doing some pike flies today. We've got our, uh, one of our favorites, Matt Martin, back. He's done a couple streams with us already, if you haven't seen him. Matt, how's it going? It's going great. We're getting, uh, you know, pretty close to the May pike openers for uh, Southern Ontario. And, you know, I've been tying up a storm for a trout opener and who knows what's going to happen with that this year. Um, but I had to just change it up a little bit, you know, start tying some bigger flies over the past couple of weeks. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. So I'm really glad you guys asked me to do this, take part in this uh, stream. Um, and I'm looking forward to sharing a few tips, tricks and uh, a few stories along the way. Yeah, that's awesome. I think um, a lot of uh, people have come to know you over the last couple of years and your, your exploits in Southern Ontario. Uh, I've probably seen a lot of trout photos and things, but you've got a, a pretty well story cap past when it comes to pike and bigger fish as well. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, like anybody kind of growing up in Southern Ontario, it, you know, I, I, I grew up in central Ontario in Barrie and we have access to like Lake Simcoe at my back door um, and all the surrounding lakes up in the Muskokas. And, and I was lucky enough to have a, you know, a father that was really um, he empowered me to get out fishing um, and, uh, you know, took me there, you know, bought the boat, did all that kind of stuff for me and really got me into it. And Pike quickly became one of my favorites. Um, there's nothing, even a smaller, like, you know, 30 inch fish um, is just going to, you know, whether you're spin fishing or fly fishing, um, absolutely crush your, your lure or your fly. Um, you have a couple good runs in it, um, you know, and, and it's even better when you manage to hook into something up in that high 30s or 40 inch range um, that actually... Um, you know, fight really hard. A lot of people don't think they, they think they've always heard that, you know, pike don't fight. Um, so they don't run like a big steelhead or, you know, or, or a cart for that matter. But uh, do they ever bulldog? You know, you just can't, you can't budge them. Um, one of the best feelings is that that big strip set, once you see a big eat and your rod just doesn't go anywhere, it just locks up and it's loaded and you didn't budge the fish, even though you pulled three or four feet of line on the strip set. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're a lot of fun. Uh, I uh, have also spent a lot of time in Northern Ontario. I guided for four, years, four seasons up on Lake of the Woods um, for muskie and pike um, and, and walleye when people wanted something to eat. Um, <laughs> but uh, I quickly fell in love with those, you know, the other two of the fish, muskie, um, a lot harder to catch, but uh, we'll take similar flies and similar gear. Um, but I should just note quickly, after the last few seasons, I've been... Uh, very fortunate to be able to go to Northern Ontario for a couple of trips for a, a couple of weeks, both times. Um, or I guess I should say just over a week each time, but up to Lake Nipigon and uh, really learn to dial in those uh, big spring monster pike and where they live and what they want to eat. Um, and uh, <clears throat> sure, there's a lot more fish up there uh, than there are in some of the lakes in our you know Muskoka area, but the quality is similar, actually. There's some uh, very large pike in, in just north of Barrie, um, you know. Uh, no need to name drop any lakes right now, but, uh, you know, pretty much get out there and uh, put a boat, any any lake that's got a boat launch on it, up there probably has probably some big lakes. Probably be a good start if we wanted to name drop one, I guess. So I think that's a safe one to name drop. <laughs> Which one? Oh, if we just wanted to throw Georgian Bay out there in the mix. At oh, least. yeah, of course, Georgian Bay. Great, <laughs> great option. And pretty much every shore from, you know, yeah. even from the river mouths around, you know, Meaford and, and Thornbury, I've caught big pike in the mouth of the Beaver River after the steelhead run. Um, so there's great spots right there for sure. So um, we're going to go over a couple patterns tonight. Um, one of them, that's something that I've been working on myself, um, a tweak on an older pattern, but um, I've used for the past couple seasons with a lot of success. And then another one, the first one we're going to start with, um, that is uh, tied by uh, Matt Graevsky. Um, and uh, he's uh, an amazing pike and muskie angler uh, in the States, uh, puts together some awesome flies, um, kind of, uh, very innovative in his streamer tying techniques um and uh and you know it, they're for instance um they're they're very much like a jerk bait very soft very straight when you look at the profile um there's not a lot going on the sides that causes the bait to go left and right this one sorry is called the yard sale um his fly it's a tandem fly you've got a four out front hook and a one out rear hook um separated with some coated wire um, but the way that this is designed to work is not undulate up and down like you have with a lot of traditional pike flies. Uh, it shoots left and right. And when you strip it and give it a little bit of slack, um, this fly, because it's weighted in the middle, falls horizontally instead of nose heavy. 
uh, and it will just glide out probably a foot or more left or right, especially if you use like a, a snap connection or a jam knot, um, something like that to allow some movement. Um, so yeah, that's basically what we're gonna start with is this pattern here. Uh, I'm gonna tie it in the same color. Um, for spring pike, one of their, I guess, pr most predominant forage is suckers. Um, and suckers, while I perch, depending on the lake you're in, but where I fish, it's a lot of suckers. Um, I fish a lot of river mouths where the fish are coming in, they're staging at the river mouths, waiting for the suckers to run up or drop back into the lake when they're extremely tired and feed on them. Um, most suckers are <clears throat> brown or gold on the top, white belly, but then you get red horse suckers in some of our lakes that have a big orange bar down the side, orange tail. Um, some people, or a lot of people confuse them with carp, actually, when they catch them. They think it's a carp, but not a big sucker. Um, and uh, the pike can really key in on those at times. So I'm going to tie a sucker uh, sucker pattern in that color. Right on. To start, anyways. Yeah, I'll throw it over to you here, and you do your thing. And uh, yeah, as always, I will throw out any comments. If people have questions, just drop them in the chat, and we'll get around to answering those as we go. Uh, I should also mention we're going to focus on like kind of the spring techniques and patterns um, for flies that might be, you know, in, in late fall, you might be throwing bigger flies and I'll tie a really big one just to do it, just to show you some techniques. But a lot of the spring flies are those six to seven inch range. They don't need to be much bigger than that. Uh, colder water, lower metabolism, easier target for them to eat. Um, so, yeah, and we'll, we'll talk about where to go, yeah. kind of yeah. areas to look for while I'm tying as well. And uh, like Chris said, if you have any questions, please just let us know and I'll do my best to answer them for you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure as you go, Evo has been really good at kind of mixing and fishing with the uh, the tying. So, yeah, if I if I keep talking too much tying, please just ask some fishing questions. Sometimes I get zo so zoned in um, on what I'm doing, uh, so please remind me if I, if I forget. Yeah. All right, I just adjusted the camera so you can see tying a bit better. Is the image fairly clear there, Chris? Yeah, I'd say so. Uh, Wait, we might be able to bring the camera in just a tiny bit closer. Sure. Yeah, something like that. Cool. That works. Yeah, perfect. Awesome. All right. I'll need adjust it a little bit more there. Just down. Hopefully the, the white t-shirt helps show off what I'm tying a bit more. So um, we're going to start off with the rear hook. Um, Airx makes some really nice strong hooks. Um, one of the only hooks that I think I don't really need to touch up all that often. Even if you've checked hit bottom, I'll still check it. But they're really, really strong and fine points. Um, these ones will throw people off because they see trope predator. But as a stinger hook, it's a nice, strong, thin wire hook that doesn't take a lot to penetrate a fish if they've just nipped at the fly. Um, the front hook we'll use is their Aberdeen Predator in a four aught, so a little, quite a bit bigger, uh, one aught and four aught. Um, but the trope predator, you know, a lot of people use these for you know resident brown flies, uh, bass flies, things like that, but also work equally well for pike. Um, they're very heavy gauge, so don't worry about, you know, don't be too nervous. Um, I should note. Um, in southern Ontario, there's no, uh, at least to my knowledge, there's no restrictions on the hook points for the amount of or hooks you can use while fly fishing for pike or for fishing and pike in general. Um, but when I do go up north to Lake Nipigon, uh, there is uh, a single barbless hook um, regulation. So I'm going to tie this with two hooks. If I was to use that on that lake, <clears throat> trust me, I do snip the back hook off. Um, and then I'll just, uh, if you were tying them specifically for that, you could also just use like a 60 mil shank probably would be a good option. Um, but I like to have versatility. If I can use this down here for a little smaller fish when they just nip the tail, uh, let's start with that. I should also call out, I uh, decided to chop off the tip of my thumb while trying to make some uh, coleslaw the other night. Um, so, so it might be a little flimsy or fighting around with the, uh, with the tying, but uh, I'll do my you best. You realize you had an opportunity to say it was bitten off by a pike while fishing. I know. I mean, if it was during the season, I'd probably try saying that. But. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And then for thread, um, pretty much, I mean, I only use GSP for pike flies. Um, the great thing about this is it's not braided, it's not twisted. It's very loose um, and you can lay it down really flat by giving it a spin if needed. Um, the other great thing is if a pike's teeth nick a couple of the individual threads, your fly is not falling apart. Um, very, very strong. Um, you can't, I mean, this is, I think, 150 or 200. I can't read the label anymore. Uh, kind of torn it off there. Um, so pretty heavy gauge. Um, so it's, it's going to last. Uh, you won't be able to break the thread. I try to reserve a single pair of scissors for cutting it because it will dull out your scissors over time as well. So let's get started anyways. Enough of me talking about thread and, uh, and hooks. So I'm going to start at the eye of the hook. And with GSP, it's very slick. So you want to wrap back quite a bit while pulling down intermediately every three or four turns just to get it seated well. So you get it down there nice and tight and we're gonna give it a snip. 
All right. So one cool thing that the inventor of this fly does is he includes most of the weight in the middle and the rear of the fly. So we don't, some, some streamers, you'll see people wrap lead around the bend of the shank or just as it kind of comes around from the, the shank. Um, but what he'll use instead is a rattle. Um, and we use a rattle in there just to help it ride really level, but also cause the tail to really um, drive forward as the, the head remains still causing it to like, causing the fly to turn. Um, it's hard to describe, but you know, you're trying, you're, you're, you've stripped it. The front portion of your fly is trying to stop the rear portion and the rear portion wants to push through and it really causes a glide. So the weight in the back. Um, so we're going to put on it really just over the point of the hook, probably wrap down here. Quite a few wraps to try and get it to sit. It's just a plastic rattle. Um, you can use glass ones. I like plastic ones. They're a little bit cheaper, and I don't think I've noticed much of a difference between the two. So after I've wrapped about 10 or 12 times, I'm going to come around the base of it, similar to how I would tie in like a Clouser eye, around it twice, and try to pull laterally with that just to really cinch those point those uh, wraps down, because the rattle will want to twist on you. All right. Then just to be extra secure so it stays there, I'm going to rotate it over just a drop of Zapagap or any crazy glue. All right. And just spread that out. And I was going to give that 10 seconds or so to cure. That should be good. All right. Okay, um, so the next part you're gonna do uh, is you're gonna add the tail. Um, and in order to create some bulk on the tail, the first material we're gonna use is bucktail, um, kind of a nice orange here to go along with the uh, um, the orange uh, saddle hackles that I will be using or schlappen. Um, you wanna take hair that's kind of towards the tip of the tail because you don't want it to flare out a lot. You want it to run straight down the middle just to provide um, a little bit of structure for those feathers to keep them running straight. So you're going to take off a small pinch. We're going to tie in two small clumps. These are really small pinches. So I don't know how many pencil diameter, but uh, pretty thin. There's only, you know, 25 or 30 strands in each one of these, maybe less. And we're going to run them about, I'm just going to try to stagger the tips. Those ones came up kind of level. Maybe two and a half, three times the hook shank length. We're going to tie them in ahead of the rattle. And then we're going to tie them down the side just with a couple wraps. And then one other small group just on the other side as well. This fly is really cool because you can upsize it or downsize it according to the species you're targeting. Um, if you were using this for musky, you might use twin four odd hooks or five odd hooks. Um, you can even tie this down with um, a one odd front hook and I don't know, maybe a size one or two rear hook and fish it for browns for sure. Um, or bass, it works really well. For for years, I think the, one of the um, struggles as a fly angler <clears throat> was targeting big predatory fish when they were on like a jerk bait bite, uh, and this kind of solves that problem. All right, and then I'm gonna go around just to sync it up so it's all one piece. So it's kind of tied on either side of the rattle and then around the bottom, nice and tight. This is where the bandage comes becomes an issue. All right. Then we're going to take some nice webby uh, saddle hackle. Um, not quite schlapping. You want the tips to be really tapered. You don't want them to be too staggered. But this is what's going to create a lot of the action through tail and the glide. Um, so we're going to have, I like to tie it in four, four hackles, two per side. One longer and then one about an inch shorter on each side just to give it good taper. And one shorter one, if I can find one. Mm, there we go. Okay. So one area I always kind of struggled was getting them to try to sit flat alongside the uh, hair. So I still just be patient with it. Um, I like to provide quite a bit of pressure with my thumb against the hook shank when I lay it in there and provide a few loose wraps and then follow it up with a few tight wraps to try to keep it in place. Right, there's that one. 
And you don't need to strip away all the fluff either. Like the fluff on the saddle axle here will give you a little bit extra body with the tail, which is kind of nice. And you want those tips to line up fairly close. So I'm doing a couple wraps in front of the rattle just to secure it. And then as we come down the body, I'll do a few over top just to make sure it seats properly. And then two more. This is also good by adding a couple extra hackles is um, inevitably one of them is going to get bitten off. <laughs> it probably might, it might happen on your first fish, it might happen on your hundred fish, who knows. Uh, but this just adds a little bit more life to your fly. Um, I had one that I really liked, Chris, that uh, it just had a little bit of mojo to it. I don't know what it was, Yeah. but I ended up clipping off the the rear hook after it got so beat up. And then I put on a split ring on the front on the, on the piece of wire and actually like retied in a tail. Uh, it still works pretty well. That's all it's right. not perfect, but I know it was the trick. Sometimes, especially with bigger flies, like sometimes, you know, you just find a, a material color or something that is just hard yeah. to live and just, yeah something works with it and that's a nice thing is they these things last like you say like i've had musky flies for years in my box some of them that's not because i don't fit yeah so i the only thing i do you know because they do cost a little bit to tie and they take a lot of time um is i like to um i like to sometimes throw it when i'm storing them for the winter or on trip take some of those silica gel packets you might find in your clothing and stuff like that when you buy it or a new backpack and throw one of those in your fly box and it really keeps the hooks from rusting which is real nice all right, so now that we've done that, we've got the tail done. Uh, so the, the hackles are going to, they, they really line up nicely, creating a nice wide profile, um, which will help it really glide left and right. So the next step um, is using uh, a couple different, well, one material really for the rest of the, for the body of the fly. Um, and I'm running down out of colors on the one. Uh, this this is like a light brown. I'm not sure the exact color. H2O sculpting brush. Um, any wavy, um, fairly rigid fiber will work well for this. Um, the key is though not using too much. Is really trying to tie in sparse. And I'll use two colors: white for the belly, brown for the top, um, to really give me some proper bait fish profile. So I'm gonna get just ahead of the rattle here, and I'm gonna take off. Let's see. No, not a fine art, but a decent little chunk. Um, if you, you know, you always want to go sparser on this. I found that the, uh, in speaking to the actual inventor of this fly, if you tie it too, uh, too bulky, um, it'll hold water too much and it's a pain to cast and it doesn't get the right action. But if you tie it relatively sparse, like there's not a lot of material there. Um, like that might be something I would use for like the back on a shrimp fly or something. Like there's not a lot of material. It's really thin. I mean, you're going to stack it to create volume. You're just not going to tie in like one big chunk. So trick with this is you're going to tie it in ahead of the rattle and you want it to just extend maybe three quarters of an inch past the bend of the hook. Um, you're going to tie in a couple loose wraps, reposition it. And it doesn't have to be perfect because you're going to, you can trim it after if you need to, to get it right. And it's really slippery material. So make sure you put in some good wraps before you cinch it down. All right, so there's one. We're gonna do two stations on this hook just due to the size. If I was tying a four out hook, I'd probably do three stations on the back of this. And then we'll use the same material, but in white, like I said, for the belly. Um, actually, this one's not exactly the same. It doesn't have the flash in it. It's just the sculpting fiber, I just realized. But that's okay, it'll work. All right. So I'm going to just even up the tips a little bit here. One thing about tying these big streamers is you're going to get messy too. There's going to be a lot of hair in the air and fibers. It's not a good time of year also for my seasonal allergies to kick in. Uh, so I might be coughing or sneezing a little bit here. I apologize in advance. Um, with this one, the first one, you want to split um, the fibers. You can kind of see oh, like that so you can get it around the hook. Uh, if you only tie one side, it's not going to swim properly. Um, I don't know if it'll make a huge difference, but I like the way it looks. So you're going to try to insert that about the same length as the top hank that you tied in and a couple loose wraps, reposition it, and then one more and give it a nice pull. All right. 
And I like to leave, especially with these slick synthetic fibers, I like to leave a little bit, like I don't want to cut it too close to the thread tie-in because it'll slide off. If you leave a little bit of a bump there, I think you can probably see it. It just tends to last a little longer. It's the worst when you've got a fly that's working perfectly well and then the fibers just start falling out, you know, a bucktail or whatever it might be. One thing I always do is I always give it a whip finish in between stations. Just a little extra security and I'll give it a drop of head cement or super glue, whatever you prefer. Um, so quick little drop of head cement here. Doing this will on almost every step will really improve the life of your flies. All right, so we're just gonna do one more station. We're just gonna go forward and we're leaving about a quarter inch in between each wrap. That's kind of the goal here. All right, the next one we're gonna put in and it's gonna be like the same length. You're not trying to build up profile by adding more and more to create like um, a lot of musky flies have like a triangular shape. Like they're like triangle, long triangle from the tail to the midsection and a short uh, aggressive triangle to the front. This is really rectangular. Like that's the goal of this fly. Like it really is just straight lateral fly. So causing that nice jerk bait action. All right. And I'm gonna uneven the tips just a little bit, just so it blends a little bit better. Just by pinching it and pulling it tight. All right. Do you have any plans to get out for pike after opener, Chris? At some point. <laughs> uh, I don't. Yeah, I don't know what my schedule looks like at all at the moment. But yeah, I'm I'm juiced. But uh, we we talked a couple weeks back. We we're thinking of hitting up on Muskoka Lake. Yeah. Or uh, for some I know. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I can't wait, can't wait to get up there. Still. <laughs> that should be good. You? Yeah, it'll, I I decided to take. Um, the third week of May off from my full-time job. Um, so I'll have a little bit of time there, which is just after opener, uh, maybe a week after. Well, it's the third Saturday in May, I think, is opener up in that area. Um, so it should be that week. Um, so we'll see whether it's, uh, I don't know how much I'll get out, but hopefully once at least. Yeah, that's a nice thing for anyone who might be uh, missing heading to their favorite river with uh, the uh, travel restrictions right now is that Pike opens up just after everything lifts, so <laughs> great, yeah. great thing to be planning for. You got it. Yeah. All right. So again, leaving a little bit at the eye of the hook there uh, is important. Um, this section doesn't need to be pretty. It's going to get covered up by the front station of the fly. I'm doing a double whip finish, purposely leaving a little bit sticking out beyond there. All right. And then obviously a little bit of glue or head cement just to secure that. Okay. The nice thing about this one is if I'm not talking my way through it, it's a pretty quick fly that you can tie. Um, doesn't take a lot of steps, but those rattles are nice and loud. You'll feel them when you're stripping in, which is pretty crazy. Um, like the front hook we're gonna use uh, is a four on Aberdeen Predator by Arex again. Um, it's uh, it's a really heavy gauge hook. Like there's a lot going on there. That's not going to straighten out on many fish. Um, again, really sharp. Um, probably one, in my opinion, probably one of the better streamer hooks on the market. Like really strong. All right. So this one's going to be uh, tied almost in a similar fashion. Um, we're going to do, oh, I forgot one step on the rear. Shoot. Oh, no. It's okay. It's okay. I didn't finish it yet. A little bit of craft fur. Ah. On the top, there's a wing of craft fur. I apologize, everybody. Wow, amateur hour. <laughs> if, if Matt, the inventor, is watching this, he's probably shaking his head. All right, so uh, craft fur. I have it laying here. Yeah, so we're going to go with like um, a really dark brown just to kind of accentuate the top. Every fish has a darker top, lighter midsection, lighter belly. So don't need much. This stuff's really, really. Uh, flowy it doesn't take a lot of material to use it um, on the front station i'm going to reverse tie or sorry yeah i'm going to um, reverse tie it in so it props up on the back station i'm just going to tie it in as it lays i do like to stack the crafter a little bit for these shorter sections if i'm tying in a large fly and i want it to really flow um, i'll just take it off the the um 
the, you know, I want to call it a pelt, whatever the material it's on uh, to give you that taper. But this, I stack it a little bit just to give it a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's easier to work with, I find. So here we go. Just a couple wraps. Won't take much here. As you're doing that, Matt, we did have a couple of questions come in. So that I'd leave sure, it. Sure. What's up? Uh, through that what do you got? Uh, I'll go through them in the order that it came in from our very own Gab. Uh, asking who you were up uh, fishing Nipigon with uh, a couple of seasons ago, I guess now. Yeah. He was curious uh, what your best producing color combo is for Lake Nipigon. <laughs> well, it changed actually over the years. When it was me and him, it was just everything white. Yep. Um, I don't know what was going on with that that year, but we showed up with all these giant <clears throat> pike flies. Um, and it turned out they wanted six inch like craft fur streamers. Like it was really funny, um, but worked really well. I'd say white or white and yellow. Uh, last year, uh, when I got to fish with my good friend, Nick, um, we did really well on sucker colors. Um, and um, and it actually have one of the flies here, um, an olive and white, um, this big craft fur articulation. We're gonna tie, tie this fly, this one's caught probably I, I don't want to guess maybe 50, 60 pike, maybe more. Um, it's been, it's been, uh, put back together again a few times. Um, but yeah, olive and white, I think white had a lot to do with it. Um, for the first year we were there, we were there in August, I think, right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, they weren't obviously spawning or anything, but the bright fly really stood out for us and was easy to see. So when you're casting, I think that's also key is these flies you're fishing relatively close to the surface. Um, and, uh, if you have a brighter fly, it's easy for you to see and be able to watch for when a fish is following or ready to eat. Oh, we were talking about that with Andrew. I remember like, uh, I mean, you know, you're, you're yeah. not really sight casting to the fish, but if you have a lighter fly, I know guys use this, uh, theory for, for trout too. Like everybody assumes you're going to feel this huge grab on the end when a fish takes it, but a lot of time they just kind of inhale and they're following you. And so it's just slack line. So yeah, being able to see that fly disappear can be a yeah. plus. That's it. Um, when I was up there this past spring, uh, it was it was a lot of it was a mixture of pre-spawn and post post-spawn fish. Uh, and the the uh, the post-spawn fish, some of them you'd hardly feel them grab at all. Like you said, you're just stripping, and all of a sudden there's weight, you know. Um, and that's why uh, when but when they were pre-spawn and they're super aggressive and and hungry, a lot of them. They were just crushing the flies. You had, there's no mistaking it. Um, so, um, was there any other questions while I'm at this? Yeah, there were a few. I, well, let's do one more right now, and then we'll we'll get to the other two after we're, cool. we we don't break up the tying too too much. Uh, Mitch was coming. This is already a big fly. What kind of lines are we talking to sling these things? I assume he means weights, but then I don't yeah. think talk about densities and anything that you like to fish as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, so. Depending on the, this fly, like for instance, is going to end up about seven inches. Uh, I'd throw this comfortably on my 10 weight. Um, I'd say you can go as low as a nine, uh, depending on wind conditions. Um, if you throw some of the bigger flies, um, you might want to bump up uh, like an 11, maybe maybe even musky size, like a 12. Um, but for the normal pike, I think you can completely get by fine with a nine to a 10 weight, I would say on average. Yep. For line. Um, anything that's got a short, heavy head, there's a lot of pike and musky lines on the market. Rio makes a good one. Um, I'm fond of an intermediate fly line. Uh, it just gets your streamers down a little bit deeper. And even an intermediate, you can still fish a surface fly, uh, because these flies have so much bulk. In fact, with a pop fly line, it really has this cool action where it'll like dive under the water and then come back up. So if you had an intermediate line weight matching your rod, um, some people I know will overline the rod by a single line number just to get a little bit more punch. But no, it's completely, and it comes down to your casting. And like I was telling Chris earlier, the casting is not pretty on these. It's <laughs> a lot of water loading, um, you know, a single back cast, and, and, and you're throwing it forward. Um, yeah. When I was up there with Gab, we ended up using a lot of floating lines, and we used short, uh, short sink tips. So we ended up throwing on like a six-foot section of like T11 that I used for steelheading or something. I had left over, actually, from steelheading. Uh, and then that was, uh, was dynamite. It really got us down quick, but kept the line up on the surface. You weren't down in the weeds so much. Uh, we had to present the flies on the bottom to the fish in the August. The fly had to hit bottom, and then they would turn on it and eat. When I was up there this spring, um, we were getting them inches under the surface or on the surface. So that's cool. Uh, the next step of this fly is connecting the rear section to the front hook. So I've already started the thread. Um, I've got uh, this is 50 pound stainless steel wire, coated or uncoated works. 
um, <clears throat> coded is awesome because something that bites a little bit more. Um, so what you're going to do though is, sorry, run your thread all the way to the back. Well, to about the hook point, I should say, be clear. All right. <clears throat> then you're going to lay this down. Um, I like laying it on the side. I find it lays flatter and your tail ends up running in the same profile as the, uh, the front hook that way. But I think that's open to whatever you'd like. Um, one key here is, sorry, I used two beads in between to give it some structure. You see how rigid that tail is now hanging off there? It's not just hanging on, it's super low. Um, not a big fan of trout beads, but uh, they make great uh, beads for, for pike flies. Um, so I'll throw those in and they should, the first bead, there's two of them, should just be touching the bend of the hook to help maintain that tension. Like I said, we're gonna tie these down the side and I'm gonna do two or three wraps and then a good pull. Just reposition the wire if needed. You could also get away with heavier intruder wire would work well. Um, you can use, this is just, um, uh, this is like just bite wire, like Rio bite wire, like it works fine. Um, don't use mono on pike flies for your joint. Uh, I know it's not a lot, there's a lot of beads that are protecting it, but it just takes one little nick. Um, for trout or bass, yeah, you could throw on like 25 pound mono in between would work. Um, I'm going to double this back for extra security. So I'm going to fold one of the tags back, wrap, and then I'm going to fold the second one back and wrap. Um, and then what I do with all my flies is I like to test them before I fish them. Because the last thing you'd want, I want, if my fly is going to fail, I want it to fail. I want the rear hook to fail when it's not attached to a 45 inch fish. Um, so I'll end up putting a pair of pliers on it and like really pull in uh, just to try to see if I can break it, putting about 20 pounds of pressure or so. If that stands up, it's going to be good. All right, cool. So we're going on to the front station now. Um, where did I put? Oh, here we go. And the rest of it is. What the heck? Of course it happens. All right, well, I got, oh, there it is right in front of me. Brown just on a, on a gray tabletop just really seems to blend in. All right, so I'm gonna take that same um, sculpting flash fiber. I'm gonna, again, you're gonna, when you pinch it, you'll see the tips are pretty level. I'm just gonna grab the middle and just kind of give it a little bit of a pull. And you can get a decent taper out of it then. So we're gonna tie that in pretty long. So it's gonna cover uh, the actual hook eye on your back foot hook. All right. Now these sections, I'm going to try to whip through them just so we can get through this quicker. Um, if there's any questions, just shout them out. But otherwise, I'm just going to repeat this process about four times. Uh, <laughs> same thing with this one. Because we're at the hook, we're going to flare it, create a little bit of a Y shape. We're going to squeeze that around the hook. So just since this is kind of repetitive, I guess, yes, yeah, would be a good time to throw in a couple of questions as well. So uh, sure. asking, Let's do it. Uh, Brian asked, how do you determine the rattle size to use? Or do you think about that much? That's a good question. I think um, this is like, I think they call it just, a, I forget the exact size. I think it's just medium. Uh, I think there's like, you guys have a small, medium, large. That how it works. Uh, those ones, I think, are the hairline ones. We actually stopped carrying those for the most part because we found that. Uh, oh, okay personal experience i had a couple blow up on me <laughs> oh no way so now we mainly do the the rainies ones which are just a millimeter size but yeah okay so i would say for these this like pike fly seven inches like a medium middle of the road's kind of good uh smaller for trout flies bigger for musky flies um you just want it to you don't want to be like seeing this giant rattle you want it hidden in there yeah so if you tie one on it's a little too big you'll know cool yeah that's that's a good one i don't know if that's a good answer or not the uh, larger the rattle i'd say yeah, louder it is which is no. yeah so um and then rob was asking uh when you strip this fly what kind of action do you suggest with the tip of your rod are you thinking about that much or just oh, yeah go? right good thanks for bringing that up rob um <clears throat> yeah this fly will work quite well on just the standard strip as well as um a very jerky rod movement which is what i like to do so you're going to provide a little bit of action on each strip um, not a lot, like you're probably going to pull, as you strip in your line, you're going to twitch the rod tip maybe six inches or so. And it's going to cause that fly to, what you're trying to do is give it some speed and induce slack right away to get it to glide. Like that's the idea. Um, this is like, just like you would fish, a, if anybody's convert conventional fish to jerk bait or a 
a glide bait, like a musky glide bait, kind of the same action we're looking for. Um, like a traditional musky fly is very undulating and flowy, uh, or a pike fly. This just has, you're trying to impart some action for sure. Yeah. So you're thinking, um, like if you, if you strip just a regular straight strip, you're kind of pulling the whole line tight as you do that. And so the fly doesn't really have room to move, but if you got it, you got it. In there. Thanks. Thanks for helping me become a little bit more literate there. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> I think you explained it pretty well, but yeah, just kind of covering it because I think that. No, no, I... Yeah, exactly. Just gives it a little bit extra motion and a little bit extra glide. If you just straight strip this, like I've caught a lot of fish on this, just roly poly too, just tucking the rod under your arm and moving it pretty quick. And a lot of people, the first time I started roly poly fishing for musky and pike, I thought, okay, the whole goal is to move it fast. Um, no, it's just to move it consistent. Yeah. You're just moving a consistent speed. You're not trying to like make it fly out through the water. But if you tuck a tuck the rod underneath your armpit and you just, even if you're pulling like six inches and the little jerk, quick jerks, it'll cause that fly to dart. If you do longer straight pulls, it'll glide and then it'll dive and dart. Um, it's, it's a great technique. The one thing that I have to warn everybody is, is when you do have a grab, uh, just keep stripping until you know you're tight and then worry about picking up the rod with your hand. Yep. Uh, I see. I, I think I learned from mistake. I, I tried to transition to my hand way too quick, too many times and lost a lot of fish. Um, just keep pulling, keep that rod bent. And, uh, yeah, it's using like, um, I haven't really talked too much about, you know, leaders and line. Maybe it's a good opportunity to talk about that, but, uh, um, I'm using probably, you know, at least 30 pound mono or fluoro to my bite tippet. Um, and then straight in its short sections, maybe only four feet, five feet, um, which will allow me to put a lot of pressure on these fish, not a lot of line stretch. Uh, most pike lines are, or pike and musky lines have a no stretch core or a low stretch core, which is really nice uh, for keeping contact with the fish. Um, so yeah, just keep, keep the pressure on them. And then use use heavier gear than you think. Um, like I said these flies take a little bit of time to tie, and you want to make sure you're you don't lose them on a fish or lose them on bottom. Um, you can snag bottom with these, and chances are you can probably come close to pulling the hooks, not straightened out, but bend them out a little bit. Yeah, and you can get your fly back most of the time. I think uh, a lot of people kind of psych themselves out with the larger rods unnecessarily too. Like when you're talking nine and ten weight, people think, oh, I'm going to kill my arm doing that all day. Mm-hmm. Where you're using the right gear is fishing too light. <laughs> yeah, you get tired using an eight weight or a seven weight all day throwing something like this. Uh, but a ten weight's made for the job, you know? Like if you had to buy one rod, I'd probably buy a ten weight. And it's, it's what I just had to start with for pike fishing, and I absolutely loved it. Um, it, it is a heavier rod, like the overall weight of the rod. But uh, like you said, like the action or the, the casting all day or using the right tool for the job and your shoulder's not that bad. Yeah. What will eventually hurt, especially Nick can attest to this after a few days of hard fishing, um, is your fingers really start to cramp up from stripping yeah. these big flies and strip setting into these big fish. Uh, we, I think, had many instances on the boat where we just kind of like, sat there and took like a 10 15 minute break because our hands were just so tired <laughs> um I, I like getting tired by fish i'm okay with that yeah that's not that i complain about yeah all right so we're almost there now we're going to do the last stage last station on this and uh, i've been tying it in really sparse just to make sure i don't over tie this is a little little technique so i took about half the material that i was using tie it in Clip it, and then if I find it's too sparse, just give it another section. You can always, it's easier just to tie it in twice than uh, tying in too much. All right. Tie in the white, and then we're going to transition to the next step. And we're getting pretty close to the eye, but that's okay. This is tied in. I should have enough room. I want to use the whole shank of this fly or hook. All right. Bottom. Cool. Okay, so what I like to do at this point now is I'll just take uh, just a dubbing brush, take all the laser dub out of it that I've collected over the past couple of days of tying. Nice custom color there. I'll give it a little bit of a brush. I usually keep them because you never know. Like 
kind of make some cool colors sometimes, cool blends. Something different? Why not? Okay, give it a good brush. Take a look at the profile. Um, you notice it's really flat, pretty much straight all the way across. I'm going to give it a trim now just to make sure it lays flat. And we're going to do, again, with the craft fur, a little bit bigger pinch this time. It's because we're towards the front of the fly. Now, oh yeah, it's going to level out the tips a little bit. Craft fur is kind of in three lengths, I think, when you look at it. You pull it, there's a long one, a short one, and there's one in the middle. So you're kind of going to just make the long one just slightly longer than the mid. And then that's going to go back to about the full length of your uh, front section here. Awesome. I feel the need to, uh, to interrupt a little bit here and just show you and everyone else something that I think you're going to want to play around with. Okay. We just got this. So we just became uh, hens dealers today. And oh, this I know is. What you're uh, show me. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. That's a cool blend. So, same kind of thing you're doing, but with a little modeling. Yeah, that's awesome. That. Anyway, back uh, to you. <laughs> I might throw some of that into my next order there, Chris. There you go. Um, okay. Uh, next step. Uh, so the fly at this point, you could fish it, but um, I like laser dove heads. I think they look really good. Um, they provide a lot of extra flow and they really finish off the pattern nicely. So you want a little bit of room for that head. The front, I'm going to wrap back a little bit, just secure my thread wraps. Um, but before I do that, I'm going to take uh, some gold flashaboo through the flanks. Pretty good size pinch. Getting down to the last of my gold here, too. Throw that on the list for the next order. I feel like every time I order from you guys, I'm like, yeah, I got everything. And then it gets here, and I'm like, oh, no, I forgot. <laughs> I think it's just inevitable, right? You're just going to always forget something. But luckily, shipping with you guys is really quick. So throw in another order, and it's all good. Right. Uh, this one's just going, this, you'll see on the other side when I tie it in, but this flash is going back just to the beads. Just, just at the level with the beads. With the flash, because it's pretty slick, I like to throw, pull it back and throw on a couple extra wraps just to secure it. Again, I'm all about making these flies as durable as possible. Um, the first year I went up north with Gab and my first real experience, like going for, you know, I, I can't even remember how many hundred pike we caught that week. It was over that even. I think we might have, yeah, I don't want to even guess. It was an insane amount. I thought I was going to be going through so many flies. But it's amazing, like if you tie them um, well, they, they just stand up. And I think we probably only burned through like maybe a dozen flies each. It wasn't crazy. And then the next year I went up, I still brought as many flies because, well, that's just what we do. Well, like going through. just about having backups, it's having options. You need, yeah, you need to have exactly. every color in every combo. <laughs> exactly. And then you want to make sure you have a couple because if it is a certain color and your friend didn't bring any, well. Of course. So what is that? Yeah, it's that's kind of nice. That's got to be a like hundred flies, two hundred flies. <laughs> I'd, I'd say at least, man. <laughs> like this box I haven't cleared out, and that's or, like still pretty full from our last trip. Yeah, there's probably forty or fifty in there. I had four of those, and I think last year we probably only used a handful. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, then another thing I got to order more of. So, and the head is going to be two tone laser dub. Um, uh, I like using uh, like white for the belly, similar color, maybe something that accentuates it a little bit. This is the uh, rusty bronze for the top and then just the, the white, uh, no belly white, whatever you want to call it, for the body, for the bottom. Um, but one thing I like to do is just throw on a couple um, oh, yeah, the pecs. grizzly hackle, really short spade hackles, just for like fins down the side. It adds a little bit of barring and... Uh, I don't know if it makes a huge difference to the fishing, but confidence is key, right? So, so like they're like hackles you'd really use for nothing else. Like they're super short. You're picking them out from like the edges of your cape, um, or from the neck, um, and you're gonna strip them off all the fluff, and you're gonna lay these down just down the side. So you like to tie them in so that they're kind of curving inwards to the body. They're hugging it. Yeah, either, I, I do because they lay flatter. I don't know. With other flies, I like to, if I um, tie a fly that's got a lot of bulk towards the head, like a boofer or something that I want to push a lot of water, um, I'll tie them with them opposing so they kind of cause it to move a bit. Uh, and, and they'll like undulate in the water. 
Um, but this slide, we're imparting a lot of action ourselves with our rod tip, so you want to make sure it's pretty streamlined. Yep. Cool. And make them about the same length. All right. The other great thing about laser dub is it hides your bulky heads. <laughs> These, it's hard not to build up bulk with uh, the heavier threads sometimes. Um, I mean, it's still pretty fine with this head size right now, but could be a lot worse. All right, so then with laser dub, um, it's a cool material. Um, I only probably started playing it with playing with it, yeah, playing with streamers with it a couple years ago. Um, but I'll, I'll like pretty much all of them now. I like to tie it in as a head. Um, you want a couple of clumps. Um, you're going to pull the material just out and it'll come out in like a long, uh, sorry, kind of was off camera with that. It'll come out in long. Then you want to stack the fibers. So you're going to take each end and you're going to pull them and then just kind of rotate them and pull them and rotate them. That just creates about the same length of fiber, which is really nice. And I kind of prep them here just down on the leg and I'm going to do that clump as well. You don't want to take off too much. Um, because it's hard to work with. You take too much and you end up just wasting a lot of material. So I like to tie it in in two, um, in two pieces. So one that's a little bit bulkier and then one that's a little bit slimmer. So I'm gonna level off the back section here. And we're gonna tie that in just with a wrap on top. Then we're gonna take the white, and tie it in on the bottom. Might run out of it on this fly, actually. <laughs> Good way to end it. I should mention that um, uh, we're actually teaming up uh, here with Drift on a bit of an Instagram competition for these flies. So those of you that are watching, um, I'm actually going to be raffling off these flies I'm tying tonight, which is cool. No cost. Uh, we'll be covering, obviously, the shipping and all that kind of stuff. Um, all you got to do is what you got to do is comment on the photo that Drift shared about tonight, uh, tag a friend and follow both myself and Drift. And uh, one of you lucky winners will walk away with two nice bike boys. That's right. And I don't think we had a cut off. I think as long as, yeah, as long as you do it today, that's, uh, that's still good. So if you missed out earlier today, you can still get in there on that. Yeah, it's actually, it's actually running until next uh, Thursday. I think. Oh, is it giving it a week? We're, we're going to give it some time. Okay, cool. I oh, didn't know that. Nice. So there's no, there's, no, there's no rush, which is nice. So we're not going to be raffling off tonight, but you can share this video because it'll be uh, it'll be saved on your YouTube channel, I believe. Yeah. Um, and you can watch it there and share it with friends. All right. So now we're at this point. Fly looks crazy, right? But the minute you pull that material over, it really sticks to itself. It's amazing. Start pulling it back. To work with. Oh, that's such a good material, isn't it? Love it. All right, and then the next group, this is a little bit slimmer than the first batch I tied in. All right, that's good length. And then we're gonna do the white again for the belly. We're almost there. Is there any other questions at all I should uh, answer? Not yet, but uh, I want to hear a little bit more about uh, your fishing once we're done this. And again, anyone Wait. wants to uh, pop the comment. Yes, yeah, I haven't, definitely feel free. I haven't talked much about the fishing side of it yet, so let's finish the fly off. All right, and then we're going to pull that back, pull that one back. Then I like to make sure I take my thread like a quarter turn back and kind of come out the side. If you try to come straight up, you pull the laser dub up like in crazy angles. If you get in close, it's hard to see, but you'll see thread wraps. Those are gonna be covered by the eyes of the fly. Um, really not a big deal for a predatory fish anyways. Uh, but if you come out the side, it creates a nice clean head. And you need to throw a few wraps in front just to guide the material back. And then you're gonna throw in, I usually throw in a single and then a whip finish. Oh yeah, I did it without breaking thread. Nice. <laughs> Better than I think my last one, I broke thread a few times. It's easier when you have that heavy thread. <laughs> oh yeah, I think you could use this as a 
backing. <laughs> I don't recommend that. <laughs> um, now we're at this stage. We're going to take your dubbing brush again and really go at it. All right. Cool. Quick drop of some uh, Zappa Gap or other crazy glue. Throw on a couple eyes. Just going to use a couple of the living eyes, I think, by Flyman Fishco. Those are pretty sweet. Just in red. I mean, it doesn't really, I don't think it matters too much. I don't have a favorite eye color. Just as long as it has eyes, in my opinion, I think it makes a big difference. One tip for when you're fishing um and uh me and nick thought of this just before we went on our trip last year but is bring a bunch of extra eyes and, and super glue um i've got a photo somewhere of me i think it might have been this pattern um just gluing the heck out of it when we got back to the, the camp for at night uh just trying to put it back together for the next day because i only had two of them and once you put the glue on, try not to touch the eyes too much because you'll definitely stick it to your finger. It's better to take uh, a bodkin or in this case, a tube fly needle because it's closest and just push on the pupil of the eye. And there we go. Um, you could also throw on some UV glue if you wanted to try and caress those fibers back, but these, I don't know, I haven't found a need to. The super glue really holds well on the head. Um, that's it. There we go. If you're looking so, what I like to do is I just make sure those beads are tight down the back, and that'll create a nice rigid fly. Even though that's a tandem with a wire in the middle, you see how rigid that is. Right? And when you cast, the beads will always jam up against the rear hook eye. So, anyways, yeah, that's the yard sale. Pretty sweet pattern. Yeah, that's a good one. There. Like you were saying earlier, you caught your first muskie on one? I did. <laughs> Not nearly as nicely tied at the time, but uh, yeah, on sort of like, um, if anyone knows what uh, like a sexy shad pattern looks like, like a shad blue back and yellow stripe. And yeah, yeah, that was, uh, that was a good one. It's uh, it's just such a unique action compared to most other is. Uh, flies out there. And like, um, like super durable because it's all synthetic and the glue and stuff just that so well. It just, they like Definitely. Yeah. So talking Definitely. about fishing a bit, uh, we do have a couple of questions actually come in just uh, last Cool. Time. So Let's do it. All sort of fishing related. So uh, before we dive too far into our own thoughts, um, Mitch was wondering uh, specifically about uh, fishing at like uh, Great Lakes, uh, Creek and River Mouths, like you mentioned. Um, have you done much of that? You know, is, I assume it's a springtime thing. How do you go about it? Do you fish these big flies in that case, lines? Yeah. You know, I'll walk us through that. Sorry, you're cutting out a little bit. So it's Great Lakes, springtime. Yeah, Great um, Lakes. Like, you know, like the, the river mouths and stuff. Like you mentioned, you got some up in Meaford and stuff and other. Yeah. Let's get them. Uh, any specific kind of advice on targeting those fish? Yeah. Uh, cast lots, find the warm water. Um, try to find if you're at a river mouth try to find like an area like an eddy or slow current that they'll hold um, don't be afraid to look right up on the rocks they're getting up there nice and shallow to digest their food um, the great the hard thing about georgian bay is um, at least in my experience on the southern portions of georgian bay it's a little different once you get up around like the moon river area and stuff um, the bottoms are mostly sand and limestone they're not very dark bottom not drawing a lot of heat but what does draw heat is the rocks themselves so traditionally when you go way up north everyone thinks you know mucky bottoms brown bottom dead weed 100 percent, i agree um that's where they're going to be but in the clear um you know want to call it like trout water of great lakes um they're going to be up on the rocks near structure uh near food so um if you're shore bound you know not a bad idea to bring your thermometer that you would have with you while you're trout fishing just to check water temperatures uh if you can go out to the river mouth and find river temps you know, once opener hits, you'll probably be seeing them in the upper 30s, low 40s type of thing. If you come in the river a little bit into the um, the delta or the estuary at the mouth, uh, come into an area with low current, if you can find water in the, you know, mid to high 40s, that's a, probably a good spot to start. If you're in, the, in a lake and you have access to a boat and you have access to a, a depth finder or GPS on your boat that has temperature readings, yeah, that's much more convenient. Um, but yeah, looking for, trying to find the warm water. Um, 
these fish in the spring are just they're post spawn they spawn a lot of the times just at ice out um in uh, some northern lakes they'll spawn under the ice because the ice out's not until the end of june uh, like on Nipigon, for instance they spawn right at ice out maybe a week after so when i was up there last year um, we saw a huge mix of fish that were actively spawning which are really hard to catch because they're not interested in feeding it's you know one female and four or five males chasing her around um, but you can find the, the post-spawn fish they're aggressive they're hungry they're recovering they're all scarred up because it's quite the battle it looks like when pike and muskie are spawning they'll have lots of bite marks on them lots of um, handle with care i should say because they're already stressed out and then the big pre-spawn mamas with their uh, big bellies um and they're maybe not a, not as a um hungry but they're definitely aggressive they're like get out of my face you know and sometimes that's where throwing a big fly that can imitate even a small pike isn't a bad bad option um if they're if they're interested in that so um the biggest thing i can say is keep it simple have you know a handful of flies um a couple different colors so like white something dark something natural and something bright um, so like a white one, a, a dark gray or black fly, like a black bunny leech or a black stre streamer, um, a fire tiger pattern is a good option or, and a sucker or a perch pattern would be kind of my go-to. The sucker patterns also imitate walleye pretty closely. Um, so if they're feeding on small walleye, it's a, a good option. Uh, yeah. So try to find the warm water. That's, that's pike fishing 101 for sure. Yeah. And that could be as well, I guess, like, um, I think of a lot of rivers down on Lake Ontario side where you have like, you know, small little, uh, feeder streams that, you know, tributaries to the river that might come in like way down at the bottom, or you might have, um, like say like a marsh kind of not really yeah. in the estuary, but like off to the side kind of connecting like anything like yeah. that. For There's a lot of, a lot of the, even the Eastern tributaries, the ones out there steelhead fishing and almost all those rivers have these big large marshes if you can get in there with a with, you know they're hard to wade in those waters there's they're really deep right at the bank and they're mucky if you have access to some sort of boat or you're okay bringing maybe a stripping basket along with you to manage your line uh, that can be a big help um but yeah 100 percent if you can get up to those mouths and um you know they'll they're aggressive they're in there they're feeding and they come in and then once the water warms up they shoot back out to the main lake and piker they don't really like warm water um, they consider them a warm water species when you look at, you know, fly design and techniques and stuff. But um, I think they're, I don't know, I remember reading it before, but I want to say their upper comfort levels, like these 60s, yeah, like right. low to mid 60s is kind of where they're comfortable. Uh, anything hotter than that, they're they're moving up, which is the opposite of muskie. Muskie love warm water. Um, in the middle of July in 72, 73 degree water, you'll find muskie right up shallow. Uh, pike will be off the drop off. So just fill two different niches. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, yeah, you're bang on there. Uh, and of course, I, that could be, I know um, Joe Humphreys, he talks about thinking about trout. Uh, they will sort of acclimatize to the um, to the waters that they're in. So you may find certain populations of fish, if they live in a body of water that only is you know, fairly warm, it might be different, but as a general rule of thumb, yeah. Totally. Yeah, I agree. Usually I find the lakes that are like, we have a lake in Barrie called Little Lake, and it's... Yeah been pounded by people for years and it's full of pike um you know you can go there and you can catch 50 60 pike and it's right and buried but problem is they're all you know relatively small um the warm waters um i would say in the summer that lake probably breaks 80 regularly uh, it's very hot uh, they don't get very big i've caught a 30 incher i think there when i was younger but um a lot of the warmer the water usually it stunts them a little bit um cooler water bigger fish high fatty fish like cisco's whitefish um <clears throat> things like that suckers will really encourage large growth um, some of the biggest pike you'll find are, are in those lakes like you know the great lakes or lake nipigan or lake of the woods that have big deep dark sections where there's great lake trout fishing um but a lot of shallow water as well in areas and the great thing about it is in, in the springtime all of the pike 100 percent of the population oh, let's say 98 percent of the population is in like five percent of the water they're up shallow they're like if you can find a shallow spawning bay <clears throat> with a river that's coming into it with um, standing weed from last year or uh, you know even like bulrushes right against the shore they're up there they they they, they spawn really kind of haphazardly they kind of you know they they swim around there's a bunch of males following the female and they just drop eggs they don't make nests like even a bass does um, they're scatter spawners but they're very effective uh, so much so that um, 
if pike get into a lake that was once previously dominated by muskie, uh, the muskie population starts to dwindle just because the pike encroach on uh, <clears throat> on their food source and they start to outcompete them. And also, pike spawn earlier than muskie, so at that point they predate on the young of the year muskie. So yeah, you can see it. They can live together if there's enough room. They can comfortably live together if there's enough room for them. Yeah, cool. That's awesome. Um... Rob had a question, just kind of uh, structure, temp, and water depth. So again, I guess relating back to spring, uh, sure. know, talk about them all being kind of in that 5% of the water. What is that yeah. percent of the water apart from temp? Sure. What they look I would like? say if you can get to water that's like three feet or less uh, is great. I'd say let's, say, let's be real, like six feet or less probably comfortably. Are you talking, um, so if we're talking early season, what do we, first, I guess we should narrow down. What are we talking about early season here? Oh, sure. So if you're if you're in an area that offers the ability to fish for pike pre-spawn um, by going far enough north, um, it's amazing. Also, I think Lake Ontario has an early pike season, if I remember right. It closes like March 15th, I think. March it's kind of like we do up here. Like there's ice fishing until the March 15th or so, or March 30th maybe. Um, and you can get those pre-spawn fish, but that's really early pre-spawn. Like those fish are still floating around 10, 15, 20 feet of water, uh, feeding on bait fish of whatever sort but if you can fish an area where they allow you to fish that week or two before three spawn and those fish you know they they've come out from the main lake they've you know the in march they've come into the, the points of the bay and they've started to slowly work their way back two weeks or so before the spawn kicks off those fish are going to be um, in that shallow water that you know three 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 to six feet maybe even shallower of water um so that's where I would start if, if you have the ability to fish a lake that allows you to um, get up there, get up in the, the, the six to, th you know, six to three feet or three to six feet of water and start casting. Um, if you have a bottom that's light colored, if you have a lake that's full of sand, um, put your polarized sunglasses on, go out on a day when it's nice and sunny. Those fish are going to be up shallow and you can sight fish for them. It's some of the most exhilarating um, fishing for ESOX predators that we have. Um, basically my thing I like to take people out is cast anything, cast at anything that looks like a log on the bottom because it's probably not a log. Um, and if it is, well, no big deal. Um, uh, and then, uh, if it's cloudy overcast, uh, you can't see the fish. The bottom is black because it's <clears throat> very mucky. It's dead weeds from previous years. You'll want to, you'll want a fan cast. If you have two people in the boat casting left or right. Um, but, uh, keep your casts short. They don't have to be long. Uh, I'd rather cast more often than cast once really far. If you, you're not casting, you, you're not even probably casting 60 feet. Like they're pretty short casts. I think a lot of them are your head length plus a bit of running line, maybe 40 feet foot casts. Um, these fish will, they're not hugely afraid of your boat. Um, so you can get in pretty close uh, and you'll get a lot of strikes right at, uh, at the edge of your boat. You'll see them come up out of nowhere, chase it, eat it, uh, swirl on it, uh, things like that. Uh, so that's kind of what you should be focusing on pre-spawn. Once the season opens up down here, they're post-spawn. Uh, they're going to be in similar water. Like when they're spawning, they'll be up in a foot of water or less. You'll see their backs out of the water, see their fin kind of kicking around, see nervous water, similar to like what you would see if you were fishing salt water. Um, <clears throat> but we can't target them because for me, um, they're closed down here. Once they open up uh, at the end of May, um, they're still going to be up shallow if the water temperatures allow. So if the water temps are still in those, you know, 50s, they're going to be up there. That's where most of the food is. Uh, the suckers are coming back down into the lakes from their spawn. They drop back or they don't all die after their spawn. Um, you know, the, the panfish have moved up. The, more importantly, a lot of the bass are moving up shallow to start their spawn. So they are, they are a food source, uh, depending on the size of the bass in your lake. Uh, a small male, like one pound smallmouth is more than enough for, a, you know, a 32, 33 inch northern will we'll definitely feel free to eat that. Um, so yeah, so that's that's post spawn, um, and then the difference with post spawn fish I find um, is they're going to be a little bit beat up. Um, they're going to be really skinny. They're going to be hungry and aggressive. Uh, so brighter colors often work well. Um, and then uh, and then if it gets really dark, uh, switching to dark flies like a bunny leech or something, something to provide a lot of contrast. That's where I'd start. Then you're in the mid season which gets challenging. Um, you know, you get into the summer, they go deep. You're fishing full sink lines. You might be fishing. 12 to 20 feet of water if you want to target them i almost just i i prefer to change species uh or, or go somewhere else fish a different uh, target um and then 
once you get back into the September kind of temp range, the water temps are cooling again, they're coming up shallow again, same areas you find them in the spring. Uh, and they're predating on, you know, in, in for instance, on the lake I live just up from Lake Simcoe, they're predating on the gobies up shallow, predating on yellow perch, um, you know, small bait fish species. Um, so going relatively small again is a good option, like that four to six inch range. And then once November rolls around, the big girls are in there feeding just to kind of stock up for the winter again. So, you know, throw the big flies, you're probably going to get on our lakes, you might get one or two eats a day, but they're going to be chance at a bigger fish versus, you know, summer, summer pike, where there's a lot of small ones uh, and they're just end up destroying your flies. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So that kind of covers, yeah. Uh, season, seasonal movements there, temp and water temp, temple um, go hand in hand and structure. Like uh, do pike oh, yeah. relate heavily to structure? Uh, yes and no. I think it depends on the lake and what structures available to them. In the spring, uh, I think they just like to get shallow and get warm. Um, they're looking to get their metabolism going so they can start feeding, right? They feed all winter for sure, but really slowly. But once that spawn kicks in and their hormones are surging and they're wanting to get going, they need to start eating. And also after they spawn to recover. Um, so getting up into the water, that might only be, I think it was last year on Nipigon where we were fishing a bay. And I think the water temp was in the low 40s and it was like, no, maybe mid 40s, like 44, um, which is pretty dang cold still. Uh, but it was some of the warmest water we could find. We weren't finding many fish, but um, we changed the, we went to another bay with it with a southerly facing direction. And the wind was, uh, this bay is fully exposed to the sun and the water temp was like 51. And there were, it was almost every cast, <laughs> like you had fish everywhere. And it was only a football field apart. Sure. So finding that that warm water was really key. That's almost like a structure in itself is finding the warm water for them. Um, when you get into the warmer months and they've moved out of the shallow spawning bays, um, yeah, they relate heavily to like structure, drop offs, rock piles. Um, you know, you want to get get your fly down a little bit because they're out there chasing you know bait fish and, and some lakes like Cisco and they're they're comfortable feeding 30, 40 feet of water. I don't it's hard to target them <laughs> that deep with a fly. Um, plus it's probably not great on them pulling them up from that depth, but uh, that's where they live. And then they're not, I find like if you've musky fished before, musky relate heavily to, you know, someone's dock or some or there's a fallen tree or a piece of, you know, there's a deadhead and they'll they'll be on that. Not saying pike don't, but I, I think they're comfortable to cruise a bit more. I find like when I'm musky fishing, even with conventional gear, I'm fishing a specific spot on a spot for musky. And then I'll like take my electric motor and I'll move to another spot on a spot and I'll cast in between and I'll end up picking up a fish. But most of the time it'll be a pike. I don't know if you've experienced similar things, but I find they kind of roam. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I've never found, um, and you've done a lot more pike fishing than me. I've, I haven't personally found them relate quite as much. Maybe weeds in the summer, like deep mm -hmm. weed line. Cabbage. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Apart from just depth changes, but yeah, no, I'd agree. They're, they, I think they're more cruisy than people give them credit for. Yeah. For the mid season. Most of the time, you know, they're up. When you see them in the shallows, they're they're not holding to structure. They're a big fish. They know that. Yeah. Cool. I'm 40 inches long. An eagle might have a chance of taking me, <laughs> but there's not any other fish here that's really gonna eat me, right? So they're not like. They're, they're a lion weight predator, and I guess we, we should always mention that, that they don't like to, uh, they're not like a pelagic fish where they're cruising around looking for bait fish. They don't have a lot of energy. What they do is they sit there, belly on the bottom, in an area where fish should be traveling, and they're going to shoot forward, you know, three to six feet really quickly to eat. And that's kind of what their fight is like, too. They lunge forward. The hit is just insane. Um, you set the hook, you fight them hard for a couple minutes and, you know, and you get the net under them, um, because they, they don't have the stamina of say like a salmon or a, or a, a trout. Um, but they have a lot of power for the few minutes you do fight them, which is great. Also the gear you use is much heavier, so you can, it's better for the fish to get them in quick. Um, any major predator fish, uh, can build up lactic acid, uh, and their muscles will end up seizing. So it's not great to target pike on say a five weight, unless the fish are really, really small. Um, you're going to do more harm than good. Uh, you know, it might be fun fighting them, but you're end up going to hurt them. If you're up on Nipigon and you're throwing a seven weight for brook trout, you know, and you hook into a 40 plus inch pike, it's going to happen. You know, not, you're not targeting it. It's not the end of the world. And, you know, in cooler water, it's got a good chance, but, uh, you definitely want to come with the right gear. Yep. Absolutely. Cool. As you would with anything. Cool. So you want to jump into fly number two? Okay. Um, I do. 
I'm going to show it off again. I don't know. Did I show that one already? Can't remember if I did. Oh, well. We'll just get tying. Oh, it's right here. So um, I was talking to Chris, like, what I should be tying. And, like, you know, uh, you guys recently had um, a, a pike angler on. Um, Andrew. And, uh, yeah. Who was it again? Sorry. I uh, didn't know I saw that one. Was that Andrew? Andrew, right. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, he's fishing northern Saskatchewan, right? And like crazy, it's completely different um, than what we experience down here. There's pike everywhere there. Um, so uh, in spring flies, like I said, I usually go smaller, seven inches or less. But we did decide on maybe throwing in one big fly, uh, something I would use for that post-spawn fish. Um, we were using doing this fly uh, a lot on Nipigon last year. Um, it measures in just over 12 inches. It's pretty serious. Um, what it is is very similar to like a double deceiver a little bit of tweaks on it than the traditional double deceiver fly. Um, it's in this color combo, it's made to represent a Cisco whitefish, white with a little bit of blue or purple hues in it is very important. If you catch a whitefish or a Cisco, you'll see they're very purpley. Um, but also, you know, it's just white and it stands out. So fish are gonna see it. Every fish has a white belly. Um, so when a pike's looking at it from below, it could represent a lot of different species. Um, the, oh, we'll get into this one. One cool thing about this platform is when you get to the final step, you can do kind of a few different things with it. You could throw on a Buford head and you get a really cool moving fly that'll only ride a few inches under the surface and push a lot of water. Not quite a surface lure, um, not quite a big deep streamer. Now uh, you can throw on a fish skull like I throw on this one, which gets you a little bit deeper, um, a really durable head uh, and it will dart really cool. It really kind of uh, just enough weight to get it to undulate through the water um or you could also do a laser dub head like i had before which causes it to glide really straight so it's kind of cool right when you get to the end you can kind of make your decision so let's get into it All right first one uh we're going to start off with is a 30 mil shank here uh this is to just um provide a good pivot point for your tail lots of movement so start this thread well, moving around in my jaws a little bit all right so similar to the previous fly we'll start off with just a pinch of bucktail and close to the tip all right tie that on just I start on the top. What I do is I give it a loose wrap just so it's on there, and then just give it a little, give the butts a little wiggle, and that'll help it flip to both sides of the hook. So you get a nice even distribution of bucktail. Bucktail is a really slick material, and it often will pop out on you. So you do want to use a heavy thread that you can cinch down on. And leaving a couple butts here doesn't hurt either. Then we're going to do take a little silver flash, flash boo. Need to be a lot. Um, I think flash on pike flies is important, but I think it's a fine balance. Like flash doesn't provide a lot of movement in the water. It provides a lot of glare and a lot of shimmering material, but I don't know. I've tied some that are a lot of flash and I've seemed to do better when it's just like a nice, just small amount, a little more subtle. So I can tie these in about one and a half times as long as the bucktail and same thing couple one loose wrap and then just a little shimmy there gets that bucktail to, or that uh, flash to fully go around the whole hook uh, a couple tight wraps the tail on this one um, is going to be white shop and I had that out I had that ready to go oh, yeah Schlappen is just a really st um, durable stem. It seems to last quite a long time. It, compared to those saddle hackles, it's kind of, an, I don't know, a bit of an ugly feather. It doesn't really, some of them are really nice and I don't have any of those, but uh, they tend to be a little, they, don't, they really stick together. They're really webby, but that's what provides the movement that we're looking for. We want something that just the tail is constantly moving on this. Um, so you're going to select four relatively long ones. We're not going, we're not trying to make a subtle fly here. This one's going to be big. One more. Which one do I want? All right. 
So we're going to strip the strip the webbing material back here, and they always have a little bit of a natural curl. Um, I'm trying the best I can to get the tips to kind of splay away from each other here, just to provide a little bit extra movement when you strip. Um, when you strip, that material is going to go really tight, and then it's going to splay, and it just provides just that might be that last little bit of a movement that a, a pike's looking for, just to convince it. That's going to be about almost perfect as long as your flash, which is the goal. They're definitely not the fastest flies to tie in the world. They make up for it with their uh, longevity, I guess. <laughs> yeah. They're fun. Do. I guess that. Not a hit or fourth one, I guess not. Not a completely monotonous tie. Yeah, definitely. There's, they're fun to tie. Yeah. Like, you know, you, you might spend some musky flies, Frig. I look at the clock and it's like, oh my God, 45 minutes. <laughs> Where'd that go? Um, but uh, yeah, it's fun. Changes it up. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, that's in there. Big bulky tail. You can't really see it. Uh, just adjust the camera a little bit. Um, lots of length. Hopefully that lasts a long time. Uh, I don't have a hook on that. So that's probably going to end up down their throat or off to the sides. So the tail ends up lasting quite a while on these flies, I find. It's wherever you put a hook is where they start to fall apart. Um, but we're gonna put a couple of whip finishes in. Then we're gonna do, take the thread deck up. Um, and then we're gonna throw in some silver polar chenille. Whoops. <laughs> Thought I had the end. Um, Great material for many different types of flies. I'm gonna cut the length that I'll probably need for the entire fly. Easier to manage than two and a half meters of it. Um, this though, when you rotate it, it is actually like on one side. There's kind of like a stem and the material flows backwards. So you wanna think about that when you're wrapping it in. Um, I don't, in this fly, some flies, like if I do like a reverse tied spay fly or something, I want the flash forward. It helps prop up your marabou feather. But in this sense, I want the material to cut flow back. Um, so we're going to lay it on top of the shank, a few loose wraps, and come forward, pulling whatever stray material back you find because it's not perfect. All right. Now what you're going to do is you don't need to overdo the flash. You're going to do uh, just evenly spaced turns here on the cat, uh, pro, on the, uh, oh my gosh, what am I calling it? <laughs> I lost the word. Polar chenille. Um, wrap it around your thread, give it a single tie off, and cut it short. And those will all flow back nicely. Now at this point, the this station, there's gonna be a lot of bucktail on this fly, but I want a natural taper. So it's gonna start off with just craft fur. That's gonna provide a nice like transition into the tail. It doesn't need a lot of prop. Um, so I'm gonna do just white craft fur, probably. Pretty good bunch. Maybe a little bit more than say a pencil or so if you want to go terminology. And I'm not going to reverse tie it or anything. This I want it to taper throughout. So we're going to put one section on the near side of the hook with a couple turns. Go. Yep. And then one on the far section. Far side. Uh, synthetic materials with bucktail is a great combination because bucktail will provide the prop that you need. The synthetics provide the waterproofness and, and the flow that you're looking for, um, which is great. If you use natural materials, a lot of them hold water and it can make casting pretty tricky. Also makes a very rigid fly. So nice combination of two synthetic and natural is always my favorite. 
You could also do this with like bucktail brushes or anything like that would be a good option too if you make your own. All right, so very ugly hit on this. That's okay. Because the thread actually slipped through the eye opening of that chain. I hate when it does that, but I'm not gonna lie. That's what happened. Still got enough room there. Oh yeah, oh yeah, it'll be fine. Blame it on the thumb. Yeah, exactly. I don't think I'm the first one with a banged up thumb tie-in with you guys though, too. I think uh, Ian did that one. Uh, yeah, Ian had a mangled thumb. A couple weeks. <laughs> I was I couldn't believe it. I was like, of course, yeah. I'm gonna go into a live video tomorrow night. Decided to chop the tip off. Great. Yeah. It's a good thing you guys don't have jobs as hand models. George <laughs> Stan. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, all right, cool. So that's the tail. It's really short. There's only a 30 mil shank in there. There's not a lot going on. Um, I'm gonna use another Arex uh, Aberdeen Predator Aberdeen, but a lot smaller uh, than. Oh, well, it's bigger than what I was using before. I was using a one-up before. This is a two-up. Um, I just want a bit of a heavier hook for the back station on this fly. It's a bigger fly, potentially bigger fish. The one that's strong in, in that uh, trout predator, but this is the Aberdeen predator. It's really heavy gauge. Um, it's going to stand up for the fish. Um, if I remember right, yeah. I'll make sure I'm not missing any steps here. Um, we're also going to tie this one in with wire and a single bead just to provide some spacing. Uh, getting down to the last of my wire bite, too. Don't worry, I'm keeping a list for you. Yeah, that's it. And have a junky pair of scissors you don't mind cutting it with. Side cutters work, too. Um, but. All right, so uh, we're going to start this eye. Oh, come on. Oh. So the nice thing about this one, I'm going to tie a really short piece of wire on. There's no hook in this. So I'm not worried about it getting pulled out by a fish. Um, I'm not going to double it back. I don't think I don't need to. It helps reduce the bulk. Want that there just to provide some spacing. There we go. The bead helps um, create some rigidness in your fly and stops your tail from foul, foul, ugh, fouling on your back hook as much. Just a little bit of space. Uh, if you put on two of them, it also kind of creates a nice little rattle too, which is nice. So, no, I don't have a rattle on this fly like the other one. You could throw one on if you want it. This is one that I've um, been working on just for a couple of years, uh, and I've got it to the point where I'm really happy with the way it fishes. Um, a good balance of uh, castability, but also bulk, which is very important. Um, so what we're going to do with the next stage here, so we're going to take a white bucktail, um, one that's, uh, as the bucktail starts at the tip, it's very soft and pliable. As you get down towards the base, the fibers get more stiff, similar to body hair almost at the butt. Um, as we start at the back of the fly, we're going to start with the tip of the bucktail. And then as we get towards the head, we're going to start working our way down to provide that bulk that we need the front just to push some water. So uh, the back here doesn't need to be a lot, just enough to be a little bit of a prop for our first stage of craft fur or in, on this shank here. And at this point, um, I'm going to do a single, uh, it's going to be double back. So it's tied in forward, folded back. And it's going to start off the, the shape that we're looking for. It's tied in pretty short. I don't want this to be like a super long section of bucktail. Um, tying it in reverse like this just allows minimal material to provide as much bulk as possible. And we're not looking for a, um, a big, huge head on the middle section of this fly it's just enough to provide a little bit of shape all right 
So when it comes to stuff pushing it back, um, I know they make tools for it. <laughs> uh, I use my fingers. Um, I used I used it for years. The ballpoint pen hollowed out works really well. You just slip it on the hook and you just force your material back. Um, it allows you to kind of capture it all in one shot. Now, the trick with this is just tying in in front. You're not wanting to trap the materials underneath of the thread because that'll be just, it just is counterintuitive to what you were trying to do with it originally. But you want to wrap forward about a half inch and just start a taper. If you go, especially with this thick GSP, if you go too much in one spot, it'll just slip down on itself and it doesn't really do anything. So I'll just keep going back and forth and spending a little bit more time up near the base of the material and you see it really pops up kind of white on uh, a white t-shirt it's kind of hard to see actually i should have worn a black one for this fly um but i hope everybody's making sense of this i want it to be a little bit more streamlined actually that's getting there so it's slightly more than the back and each stage forward is going to be a little bit more prop is the goal there we go perfect then we're going to take uh white crafter and it is a little repetitive too, um, like the first fly tie in the body stage here, with a couple little tweaks as we go. So I'm not going to reverse tie the craft fern because the bucktail is already doing that for me. But this one, I'm just going to try. I took a pretty good clump. We're going to try to work it all the way around the shank. There we go. So very minimal material there, but it's already provided some quite a bit of bulk there. And as we go up the fly, it'll just get bulkier and bulkier without um providing too much weight or water uh, holding abilities to reduce your cast ability um i really started out with like the hollow tie a lot of guys were using them for bunker imitations i think for uh striped bass hollow flies um, and then the pike and musky world kind of jumped on board too so we're gonna in this hook we're gonna start we're gonna use the same uh, polar chenille again uh this story i should specify is the large length um, you definitely want that. It's the longer material. Um, we're going to do three stations on this one. Wrap that forward, pulling the material back as you go, trying not to trap too much, but a few times through some pike's mouth, it'll uh, comb the fly out nice for you. There we go. All right, and then a little more bucktail. Now I'm working uh, maybe an inch down from where I picked the other pieces. Uh, do you have any uh, pike tips or anything you'd want to go over, Chris? Material like uh, lines or rod setups or anything? Well, I don't know. I think he covered it pretty well. Okay. <laughs> um. Any, Honestly, any for for you. Shot? Oh, here's here's one for you. Um, I have some opinions on this, but you probably have more educated ones. Uh, wire versus fluoro for your leader. Okay, so great question. When I was conventional angler, I fished fluoro all the time. That's because those lures have something to really make them move. There's a big bill or blades or something that's causing the fly to, or the, the lure to flip around and cause a lot of action. In order to get good action out of your fly, you have to use like 50 pound and you're gonna get bit off. Um, I, I've tried it, I've failed at it, been bit off by Big Pike for sure doing that. Uh, I like wire. Yep. Um, I like a coated wire. Uh, it's a little bit less damaging to the fish. Um, it's also nice that coated wire you can tie a normal knot with, um, which is a really cool feature. Um, Uncoated wire, people use it. Uh, you just have to crimp your fly on or use a crimp to a, to a snap and then it works too. Um, but if you were to use fluoro, like if you're like, I'm, I, I think I need fluoro because the water is so clear, um, don't do anything less than like 100 pounds. Like it's got to be really heavy and that's really going to kill a lot of the action on your fly. Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree for the most but, part. I have found, I am pretty confident on a couple fisheries more musky than pike that wire mm -hmm. does spook them because i've tried it and right so i will go fluoro but yeah same thing 100 pound yeah i think it's like the really clear water situations heavily pressured fish yeah um yeah definitely you can go with it but it's got to be really heavy fluoro yeah and you're right it, it destroys the action of the fly so i only use it for like um 
flies that have a lot of motion cap built into the materials. Not yeah. that you if want. you had like a, a Buford or something with a, one yeah. of those wiggle tails or something on it, like, you know what, those things move enough water on their own. What do you think about those wiggle tails? And to be honest, I'm not huge on them. Just they, they're a bit of a nightmare to cast. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, Buf- sure. Buford's are probably my favorite fly of all time for Pika muskies. So. Oh, it's deadly. Can't miss there. Um, or like a, a beast fly, something like that, where yeah, well, a big hollow beast oh. is oh. yeah, lots of that's a whole bucktail per fly, though. <laughs> not quite, not if you time right. <laughs> they, those are time consuming, though. Those are a solid yeah, app. They really are. Do you tie those on mono or lots of shanks? Oh, on mono, I've done it both, but the shanks uh, they sink pretty quick, so usually just yeah, yeah, heavy mono. That's what I've heard. I've never actually uh, attempted to tie any of them bigger than like six or eight inches, like I've. Yeah. I haven't tied any of the giant ones. They cast pretty easily, which is nice. And well, that's the cool thing. I watched them close. being cast on like a five weight. Like you can actually do it. Not that they were fishing with it, but they were uh, they were showing you that it can be done. Yeah, like a ten inch plus fly. Yeah, but yeah, anything that you want to swim, like it's going back to the floral thing. Like fly, you want to get some kind of like jackknifing action. It just doesn't allow you to really do it well. So yeah, wire if you can get away. I think I'm on the same page as you there. Definitely. Yeah. Um, have you used titanium wire before? To be honest, I haven't, but uh, we just got some uh, code titanium in from uh, from SA that I'm excited to try this year, just because it doesn't kink, which would be nice. Not- it's really cool. Yeah. I've used it. It's really cool. Too bad. Um, one liter for, like, multiple days of fishing, which is really nice. Yeah. Especially if you use, like, a, a snap. Like, I like using snaps for, for pike flies, uh, pike and musky. Just makes changing flies easier. Um, and you're not cutting down wire bite all the time, but uh, cool. All right, so I'm just going to do one last little stage of crafter here, just to fill in that whole hook, and then we're going to move on to the final hook uh, in this, which is good. So we're going to wrap that around the shank. Once that's in, I'm going to give that a good brush. Cool. You want to get a lot of material all over you. Crafter is a good way to do it. Almost as bad as spinning bucktail or um, deer hair, body hair. All right. So that's the rear portion of this fly. And that's only like, you know, that's half of a fly, which is pretty crazy to think of. Um, half of a fly is eight inches, which is pretty wild. Could you throw uh, eyes on that? You know, add a little bit of a color to the back? Totally. It's the cool thing about these things. There's no set rules. I mean, you can really play with them. But if you look at the profile, it's really starting to splay there, which uh, Pike and Musky both hunt heavily with their lateral line and their eyes and lateral line senses, they can pick up that pulsing fly from quite a ways away. Uh, so let's go with, uh, we have a two out on the back. I don't have any five outs, but I'm going to go with a four out on the front. I think it's adequate. Um, the yeah, Aberdeen Predators are nice. I like the shank length on them. They give you quite a bit of platform to play with on the, on the fly, which is nice. Let's tighten that up. Nope. All right, we're getting there. I don't know if there's anything else we should talk about from the fishing side of things. Um, I guess to talk about like the the actual what happens when you connect with a fish, um, and that's uh, keep stripping, um, strip set, don't trout set on these. Um, it's going to happen. You're going to lose fish doing it that way. Um, if you strip set and you miss a fish, it's great because the fish is going to be right on it. It's going to be right behind it. You might get a second shot at it. Versus the trout set where you might pull that fly 10, 15 feet away from it and it might be gone. So strip set it. Um, I like to keep a low rod angle once you hook up on musky and pike. They like to come to the surface and shake their head. And that's when you're going to lose fish. Um, so keeping a real low, rod, low rod angle is important. Um, oh, and uh, while you're 
uh, stripping to fly in, uh, especially with intermediate lines. Uh, keep your rod tip just at water's level or even submerge it a little bit. It's not a bad idea. It allows you to get a little bit more uh, control of your line, direct contact to the fish, which is uh, goes for all species um, when you're using a sinking line. Even a floating line for that matter, the closer you get it to the surface, the less sag you have in it, which is important. Uh, have a good net. Um, these things are hard to hand land. Um, you know, if you're waiting for them, we had some situations last year on Nipigon where um, our boat was spooking the fish and all we were seeing were these giant dust clouds on the bottom where our fish took off. So Nick and myself decided to jump out of the boat and wade really slowly along the, like the, the grass flats. And we got into quite a few fish, but because we were waiting, we didn't have the ability to carry a big musky sized net with us. Um, kind of a funny story uh, that the first fish that I think Nick hooked while we were waiting was really big and it was on our day two. Um, and at that point he hadn't um, broke the 40 inch, forgot to, just, he hadn't broke the 40 inch uh, line yet. He caught a, a couple, like a lot of high 30s the day before, 37s, 38s, a couple 39s. And he hooked this big fish and uh, he kept saying, it's big, it's big. Uh, and uh, I, I didn't want him to, you know, lose it, obviously. So we kept our cool. And I'm like, oh, yeah, man, it's like, you know, it's mid 30s, like nothing crazy, like whatever. Um, and, you know, I had an opportunity to land it and it had no net. And you're trying to like, I don't like grabbing them by the gill to land them. It's really hard on your knuckles, never mind the fish. Um, I like to do a quick little pinch uh, behind the gill plates and then grab the tail and then you can kind of control them that way. Um, and I did that probably three times before I managed to actually get my hands on the fish. Um, and uh, the first thing I did was when I finally got my hands on the fish after the third attempt of hooking, this isn't laying properly. Uh, I turned around and I was like, welcome to the 40 club, you know, and it was like a 42 or something like that. It was a big fish, um, but kept, kept, kept as cool that way at least. Yeah. So yeah, have a big um, net though, if you can. <laughs> if you have a big net, oh, life's easy. Yeah. Well, easier, I should say. Easier on the fish. Uh, wading is great because you can, you know, stay in the water with the fish, so it's no problem. Uh, in a boat with, like, you know, two-foot-high freeboard and stuff, it's really hard to keep that fish in the water without a net, and it's super important to keep them wet. Um, just like our friend's trout, keep them in the water as much as you can. Gripping grins are cool with them, you know, but just try to minimize the time out of the water. Uh, but, yeah, there's a bunch of big nets out there by major conventional musky companies that are all adequate um i don't know if there's been any like fly companies that have jumped on board yet with making pike specific nets or uh, landing gear there may be um, not that i'm aware of so the the two we carry the rising and the fish ponds you yeah. could potentially use some of the bigger ones uh thinking the boat nets or the uh lunkers that's true yeah some fish around here like if you're consistently getting 40 plus inch fish frankly i'd say just get yourself like a proper musky size net, like one that you yeah. fit in yourself. But yeah, fishing... It's really important. It. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say, you know, if you're fishing in southern Ontario, apart from the Great Lakes, a lot of the fish that you're going to get are, you know, maybe up to 35 inch. And if you think yeah. a big steelhead is 35, and we fit those in these nets, no problem. You should totally. do fish up to that. I think what the difference would be is the bag depth. Yes, so you can actually keep them in the water. Uh, so be, I guess the, the big difference fishing off a, um, a higher boat for sure. If you have a the minute, you, the minute you throw a boat into the mix, it's like yeah, that's true. Bag yeah. is important because the um, big nets you can hang off the side. Yeah, and then you got a lot of things going on in the net. You know, like luckily I I pinch my barbs when I fish for pike. I haven't lost a fish because of barbless hook, in my opinion. Um, so it reduces the anxiety when you're going to unhook them in the net because usually you net these fish when they're quite green still they got a lot of energy um so they're going to thrash around quite a bit also if a hook gets buried in the net it's so painful trying to dig a barbed hook out of the net so barbless is key um other thing uh to keep in mind um, is have the right release tools nearby and ready um three things you should always have long-nosed pliers um very very important uh followed up by bolt cutters uh, to cut the hooks in case of you getting hooked to the fish or the fish getting like potentially fatally hooked, especially with musky, warm water. Um, 
and jaw spreaders is another thing that we like to have just because uh, there's some photos I think you guys shared one of them. Um, pike aren't afraid to take a fly deep, um, especially when they're hungry and aggressive. They're going to really take those flies down. And um, Nick would attest that when we fish nip again, like it's, it's regulated barbless. Um, and all of the fish, we didn't have any that were like lip hooked. They were always down in the gullet. Um, and that's on like a really quick reaction hook sale. You saw the E, you know, you felt it. You, you, so going single hook is not an issue there, even with a fly this size. Um, but the barbless makes it super easy and the hooks usually pop out in the net on their own, if not just with the, within seconds with a pair of jaw spreaders and long nose pliers. Don't put your hands in the mouth. Don't try to open the mouth with your hands to try and get a better look at where your fly is. It's going to end up in pain for you. Uh, one other thing I like to have in the boat is like for in general, but, uh, just a simple first aid kit for yourself. Yeah. Um, you're not going to hit anything that's really potentially going to end your day pike fishing, but it can really hinder your day. So if you have some of those, uh, a good selection of bandages and medical tape you can go a long way. Um, Fashion. in many ways, it also in a pinch makes a good stripping guard. If you forgot your stripping guard. Um, but yeah okay so um and then also while you're releasing them make sure to take your time with it don't rush them uh, treat them with respect they deserve it a lot of the northern lakes locals don't seem to like them all that much <laughs> but i love them so release them with your hand on the tail um that's the next important thing um the next flash because we're trying to taper up now uh, is this stuff called Predator Wrap, Hula Wrap. This stuff's pretty great. Um, I got this from you guys from a while ago. I had this for a long time. Do you still have any in your shop? I still do. Yeah, we do We do sell that. Um, but Predator Wrap is very similar too, so you could use either one for sure. Yeah, very similar stuff. Um, what it is is like really big cactus shin heel. Um, it's, or, or polar shin heel, I should say. Um, these fibers are over three inches long. Um, great thing about it is you can trim it to whatever length you want once you tie it in. So if you want it shorter, um, I like using the full material, but we're using this just as a bit of a prop in between the stations. Pull wraps. And similar to the polar chenille, you don't need to use a ton of it. Um, uh, use a pair of hackle pliers and save the material a little bit more. So, and these are probably spaced out a half a centimeter or so. You don't need touching turns with this stuff. It's super easy to put on too much of it. Not that I think you wouldn't catch as many fish. It's just you don't need that much. It, the more you, more synthetic, like, flash is really rigid, um, and it can hinder the action on your fly. All right. We're getting there, I promise. <laughs> All right, now we're getting towards the base of the bucktail, just adding more and more volume as we get up to the front. So as you're doing at this point, oh, sorry. go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say we had another question, but if you had something I mentioned there, by, by all means. Oh, um, I was just going to say at this point, this is the last stage of bucktail I'm going to do. I want enough room in the head for craft bird. I'm going to do a fish mask on this one. I really like the way they look uh, and provide a durable fly. So. Massage that around and just give it a wrap. Cool. What was the question? Um, Rob is asking uh, if you had any specific kind of tactics for fishing close to the boat. I don't know if he means just casting, you know, short from the boat, yeah. or if he's talking about just as your fly is getting close. If you have sure. a lower, like I think he probably means the later. I, I mean, I don't want to speak for him, but that's how I interpret the question. Yeah. Um, I guess I can speak to both. Uh, short casts, you know, I love them. Keep them short. Don't cast far. Don't get tired doing it. Uh, erratic strip into the boat. But uh, most importantly is when you get close to the boat, is don't look at your fly. Look like three, four feet behind it. Keep an eye on behind it. because That's when you're going to see a fall over. Look for a flash. Um, look for a fish. Like it's sometimes going to be really obvious. You know, you're going to see them. Um, when you get them close to the boat uh i always like to do it comes from my conventional days i'm not big on like i guess i've never i haven't caught a lot of pike in the figure eight let's put it that way 
everyone's probably heard of the figure eight. You get a musky following, stick your rod tip in the water, move your fly around in an eight. What I like to do in every cast with a fly um, is simple. I, I get to my leader, uh, which is only maybe three, four feet beyond my line, uh, and give it a lift. And it will cause the fly to lift up and pause. Don't go to cast right away because the amount of times, even after giving it a pause, I go to cast, a fish comes out of the water right? Especially in lakes that have a lot of pike. Um, so I like to give it a lift with the rod, just kind of do like a, like a bit of a, like stutter your cast a little bit, like lift it up and just kill it and let it just come up and hover. And it kind of causes the fly to turn around, do something different. And oftentimes if one's behind it or underneath it, you didn't see it, they'll eat it. The other thing you can do is strip it into your leader and just do a quick L turn at the boat, like bring your rod in. And if you're right-handed, move it to the right. Your fly will do like a gradual curve to the right. <clears throat> And it'll cause a fish to turn and flash if it's following it, so you'll see it. Um, and uh, and just basically like, don't rush your cast. Uh, that's the biggest thing I can say is like, just let it sit for a two or three count right at the side of the boat. Um, you're gonna see, you're gonna catch a lot of fish doing that. If you, a lot of our big fish, they they're hesitant, they're, um, they're hesitant to eat, right? So they they're gonna follow it, and because they don't get big by being dumb, I know that's overused. Um, but my biggest fish of the year last year, biggest pike of the year on our trip, came on a really, really cold day that we probably shouldn't have been out. I think it was, I don't know, June 5th or 6th, and it was snowing. We had like two inches of snow, and it was kind of wild. We weren't catching many fish, but then I had this big one just come out and follow me for like 15 feet, 20 feet maybe. And I was able to call to the guys in the boat, be like, hey, big fish, big fish, following. And they all watched it come right up behind my fly, and I just killed it. And it hovered it in front of its face. And it was such a cold day. That fish just, just took it all in. And it was like a 10, 12 inch fly too. And, you know, and when you're in short line, sometimes a really quick strip slash trout set kind of combo is a good option because you need to move that fly vertically to get it into the roof of their mouth. If you pull it straight out of their mouth, it's going to come out. So I said before, no trout sets, but like boat side eats, sometimes your only option is to just lift straight up into the fish. Yeah. Um, don't pull away from them. If anything, pull towards their tail if they're eating it on a figure eight or lift straight up into the roof of their mouth. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, I think Andrew had um, uh, something similar to say. His his instruction cool. to uh, people on his boat were, uh, if you have those kind of boat side eats, uh, tip to tail. So move your rod tip yes. to the tail. Exactly. The and then it's almost automatic, right? They can't really spit it at that point, so. No, they're they're on. Yeah. All right. Do just two turns of this flash. That was a good question. Um, some of my favorite eats are boat side. <laughs> they are exciting. Come out of nowhere, scare the heck crap out of you and you know everyone on the boat gets a <clears throat> nice shower from the tail turning around and splashing good times yeah it is um i think you know, to to kind of believe there's a fish there with every cast like similar to muskie where you don't wait to see the fish before doing either figure no. or that that kill it kind of move like the number of times pike and musky that i've just kind of given up on it i don't see a fish following so i just go for the next cast and then as the fly comes out you just see them kind of levitate up both sides giving it just a little bit of a change just change of direction change of speed whether that's faster or slower but i kind of like to do it all with a lift you know the fly is coming from a nice level platform all the way across to a, a sudden like 45 degree increase and then this acceleration could in, in, or, um, in, will, uh increase the chances of a strike or sometimes it's that increase to that pause you know and then that fish just takes advantage you've just like tried to get away but you stopped and i'm gonna eat you all right this is coming along really nicely so a couple more stages of craft fur and some hackles we'll be done here so the one thing with the fish skulls, you want to build a relatively big platform underneath the skull to glue it. Um, so see, I'm kind of leaving the butts here. That is important. Keep them relatively short. You want to be able to get the mask on there. 
but it's okay to have some material. You want to kind of saturate it with glue and then add a little more glue. And they're pretty durable. Uh, I was telling Chris earlier that once you hit the boat with them, they usually need to be replaced. <laughs> that is the cool thing because they slide on after you've done all the time. Exactly. You replace them, right? You pull them off, they've broken off. And, you know, once they're glued on, there's no way that you're taking them off unless you crack them. Um, but yeah, it is a cool thing. All right, almost there. Now we're going to play with uh, a couple hackles. And I've got an old half saddle that's just looking really sad now. <laughs> um, I remember that one from your Murdoch Minnow. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. This one used to be, but now it's just like the ends and the last little bits of dry flies. And I don't, know, I don't fish as many dries as I once did. Um, I don't mind using it for big flies. Um, this is just going to provide somewhat of a lateral line, a little bit of movement. Uh, I'm tying in two on each side. Um, whoa, messy. Let's just back up here for a second. Put that back on there. We've created this nice kind of collar here with a nice platform to put in these hackles, which is nice. Lateral line, barring, I don't know what it does, but I find it creates, most importantly, it creates some really nice movement in the water. These are pretty small. Like if I was thinking size, like, I don't know, 16, 14, if you're using them for a dry fly, I could probably get a dozen flies out of each of these, but <laughs> that's okay. All right. Now I just your own nymph anyways, right, Chris? My hack, my dry flies consist of just a bunch of CDC. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I, I I still tie some um, some hackled flies, but a lot less, a lot less than. Yeah, eat. it's fun to tie them sometimes, like just to do a traditional. Oh yeah, like maybe you know an Adams or Catskill style. But people watching this probably don't care. They're here for pike flies, but I think it's still good to carry some for. Uh, totally windy days or for uh more turbulent water i still prefer something hackled sometimes that's true yeah they fish pocket water pretty well yeah but now i'm a yeah, lot of cdc all right so let's get back to pike <laughs> trout are just food <laughs> <laughs> we say that until we get to a trout stream <laughs> i know i can't wait to get out there <laughs> All right, uh, now we're going to play with a couple different colors just to provide um, a little bit more similarity to a Cisco or a whitefish. They all have blue or purpley hue, so we're going to go with some nice bright blue crafter here. Uh, a good alternative would be a nice, you know, dull purple would also look good. So we're going to do a double wing on this fly. So provide a little bit of a blue line. Anybody's ever caught a Cisco like out on out ice fishing on Lake Simcoe or anything, they'll agree that blue is pretty prominent on them. That it is. It's funny, this has actually been one of my best, probably my best uh musky color combo, but in oh, yeah. in lakes that did not have any kind of like silver sided bait fish. <laughs> Interesting. No herring, no Cisco, no shad, nothing. This like in the Kawarthas and stuff where it should all be perch, walleye, whatever. This one kills it for me. So maybe it just could be like something different, right? Like could be, yeah. Or I mean, white always works. So just white. yeah. <laughs> when in doubt, like I said before, every fish has a white belly. So yeah. so now I've laid in some gray on top, just enough to create a bit of contrast. That should be enough. Yep. And then just because I need to balance it out, one last little throat patch of white. Okay. I tied in some on the top, but one last pinch on the bottom just to create. If you create an uneven fly, they just don't swim right. So whether it's left to right balanced or top and bottom balanced, it's all super important. Um, and another good thing about fish masks is they hide your butt ends really well. 
Do you like to use Sharpies to color your flies at all, Chris? Or sometimes markers of some sort. Yeah, yeah, I'll do it. like a lot of time with barring and like if you wanted to do a shad, I'll do like a dot on the cheek or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It wears, but it lasts long enough to be worth it, I think. Totally. You just bring one in your boat bag, too. Yeah, yeah down in, um, whenever we go down south, bring some markers, like red and brown markers, so you can bar up your legs and put hot spots on things. Yep. Yeah, that's the same deal. Sure. Okay. All right. That's that. Uh, where is my fish mask? I had them out. Sorry, everybody. You would think of that. Oh, right there. Uh, these are big. Uh, these are the fish masks number 10s. I don't know if it's the biggest. I think it might be. They actually go up to a 15, but you rarely see it. They are ridiculous. Wow. <laughs> Tens are That's... a better way to go, I think. All right. So, um... At this step, I'm going to pull the all the craft fur back, add quite a bit of Zappa cap. need a new bottle of this, too, but it's dried shut so many times I had to cut it down. Yep. Don't worry, I've added it to your list. Sweet. All right. And then you're going to... Oh, wait, I forgot. You want to actually go back up onto the fly quite a bit with this because the, the head goes back so far. So not just on the thread wraps or the end there, and you're going to jam that on in place. Hold that for just a couple seconds, and it'll start to cure really quickly. All right, that's looking good. <clears throat> All right. Last step is just a couple eyes. Uh, da, da, da. Is there any other questions at all? No, I think you've been answering everybody's questions before they come into people's Sweet. questions. That's awesome. Glad I was able to keep up. Um, cool. So just a dab. Could probably get away with a bigger eye on this, but I'm just out of them. All right. We have a nice little circle that's kind of right in the center and allows the glue to hold. Nice little puddle while you place the eye on. Cool. So that's like uh, my whitefish or Cisco, whatever you want to call it. Now you can change this to any color you'd like to represent any species of fish. The great thing is, is when you get close, you can see there's a lot of air in there. Yeah. It's a bulky fly, like it's four inches across, five inches across, but you can see through it. So one back cast and this thing will dry right out and you can uh, fire it out there. That's kind so, of yeah. translucency too for you in the water. Yeah, when you look at uh, a bait fish, if you hold it up, to the sun you can usually see like their internal organs and, and such in there um and the beads that i've thrown in here really create that same look um the uh, polar chenille that really tight to the body creates a nice like line down the entire fly when it's against the sun um so i think it represents you know a young of the year whitefish or cisco or if it's looked at from underneath any other fish uh if you decided to tie it in you know gold and brown great walleye colors throw this as a perch pattern very similar one here but with a um, a laser dub head instead has been really good for me. Pretty similar, a little bit smaller this one, but same platform. That's the great thing, like tied the exact same way, but just finished it differently. So this won't sink as fast, won't have as much of a darting action, more of a level action straight through the water column. But yeah, totally. That's it. Awesome. Very cool. And a reminder to everyone, you could be fishing these flies this summer, and not just if you tie them yourself, but you could fish a couple of these flies that we tied tonight. Uh, so yeah, you mentioned, thanks for the reminder, we do have that contest going on for the flies. Uh, to enter into it, you have to uh, follow both the Drift and uh, your Matt Martin uh, Instagram page, uh, and yep. and just share, uh, tag a, a friend in our... Uh, 
our post and share our post on your story and sure. be entered. And then, yeah, that would make for a great someone's ball. Take home. <laughs> Pretty good deal. I'd say so. We'll get you started. Yeah. I don't know what it costs to buy these things because I tie them, but uh, <laughs> a decent price. I would say so, definitely. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks again for doing this, Matt. Always good to have you on. I'm sure we'll get something else set up at some point this year, the ring of species. We've got to find some more species for subjects for you. <laughs> hmm. Still possible. Oh, we yeah. Some options. I think we can fix something. We haven't had you do <laughs> anything tra- like steelhead related yet, so there's, there's options. I haven't had you do steelhead. That's right. It was a good, we had a really good spring before lockdown too. Lots of fish. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we could definitely do that. Yeah. We'll get Maybe that's something we look at in a few weeks or something. <laughs> cool. Well, I hope everyone has a good evening. If anyone, as always, has questions for us or Matt, you can reach us at the shop. Uh, we can always get a hold of Matt for you. Matt, you also uh, should mention do guide, although not at the moment with the lockdown, but looking. For- yeah. It's, um. I've had a, you know, had a great start to the year, had a lot of clients, a lot of fish on the bank, you know, lots of tough days, but lots of great days as well. Um, I do. I, I, uh, I, in the spring, I focus predominantly on, uh, on steelhead and the larger river systems that we have that are open, um, that give us lots of open water. Um, once opener kicks off, there's usually, there normally is about a week or so that I still will take people out steelheading. Um, then it goes straight into the resident trout up until about uh, June when we switch or end of May, early June, when we'll start to worry about water temperatures. Uh, we'll start to chase smallmouth, pike, uh, carp. Carp is a big one. Lots of interest in that this year. Um, if you are interested in getting up for carp, I do have a lot of dates open in June. I'm luckily taking uh, some time off from my full-time job in June, about five weeks worth. So I'm looking to book up uh, a lot there, which is great. Um, the great thing about carp fishing is you'll, you'll carry a small little black or a little fly on your eight weight. And then I'll be standing behind you with my 10 weight rigged up with a pike fly. Um, <laughs> and you'll get shots at pike um, in, on Georgian Bay. It'll be musky that'll be swimming through. Uh, big gar pike. It's always a, always a blast. You really never know what you're going to get into. Big multi-species day. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, you can reach me on Instagram. Like Chris said, matt.martin.fishing. Um, send me a DM if you're interested in anything, any questions about these flies, interested in getting out of the water. Uh, like I said, trout, steelhead, pike, carp bass are kind of my predominant species i like to fish for or guide for um and yeah if you just have any simple questions i'm happy to try to answer them yeah absolutely and we've got all the materials needed down at the shop um that's all we really got for tonight if uh yeah if everyone wants to, to check in for for stuff we'll get uh, materials up hopefully tomorrow i think in the description there for you otherwise awesome. we'll have hopefully another stream for you next week although i'm not entirely sure who the host is going to be And, uh, yeah, have a good night, everyone. We'll see you soon. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye.